Hi, everyone. I am absolutely thrilled to be here. Um, big thank you to UICONF for having, like, just already the, the conference is going so well. So thank you so much. Um, and it's just a, an absolute honor to be here with all of the other speakers we've seen today. They've all been amazing. Okay, so I am here today to talk about the consistency principle. This is a new idea that I believe needs to enter the wider programming nomenclature, but it is especially suited to iOS apps that will last. So I want to jump right in. There we go. OK, I want to talk about a typical code base life cycle. So imagine that we are kicking off an entirely new app. It is a Swift app. But imagine that the year is actually 2016, so it's three years ago. So the product owners are thinking about the, you know, the initial sort of shape of this product. How's it going um, to serve users? Designers are thinking about user experience. And we, the engineers, are thinking about the foundational architecture of this app. So we have a number of decisions to make that are going to shape what this initial architecture looks like. A lot of them are dependency decisions. So number one, what iOS uh, frameworks are we going to use, and how will we interact with those APIs? Another is what third-party libraries do we want to adopt? Um, what kind of like, heavy lifting are they going to do for us, and how will those fit into our overall architecture? So another one is what kind of design patterns would we like to use? How will we fit those in as well? So development of this app happens. Um, and let's fast forward one year. So it's 2017 now. Hopefully we have a successful app in the App Store. All of the stakeholders around it are thrilled. Users love it. And we, the engineers, have architected like a really solid um, architecture. So I've got this image here. This is kind of like a standard, typical iOS app sort of layered architecture. These are the type of layers that you have you know, in, in a usual app. Now, a lot of apps, like, you know, they do networking, maybe they do some data storage, perhaps not all, you know, you, maybe you're talking to a Bluetooth device instead, but um, this is, I feel like this is pretty standard, so we're going to start with this, and we're going to assume we built something with these sort of layers. We spent a lot of time uh, thinking about how to organize the stuff that's going to go inside these layers based off of decisions um, that we made. So these are, like, these are some of the decisions we made around those dependencies we had to bring in. Um, a lot of, we had a lot of work to do around notifications. It's 2016, so we leaned on UI application. Networking-wise, we decided to just stick with URL session. We brought in some third-party libraries, one for analytics, one for JSON deserialization. Again, 2016, this is before we had that nice stuff in Swift 4. Um, and for design patterns, we just went with what MVC, what ships, right? But we, we built this beautiful architecture, and we're really proud of it. Um, yeah, so time uh, ticks on, as it inevitably does. So developers roll off. New developers roll on. Industry trends shift. Product vision shifts. So let's fast forward to today. So it's now 2019. We've been working on this code base for the last two years. All of these sort of changes have been going on that we just looked at. Um, and let's look at what's happened to our architecture. So this is the original one, um, driven by these dependency decisions that we made. Let's look at what happened. So one thing we did was we adopted Alamo Fire into the networking layer. We had a new developer come on. They were like, look, we, this, is, this library is mature enough. We should adopt it, let it do some networking um, heavy lifting for us. So we decided um, to bring it in. Although it was a little hard to like, just completely integrate it into the existing networking layer, so we just kind of built a new one to sit alongside for now. Um, hopefully, we'll bring these together and unify them at some point. But for now, we're just um, going to le like, leave these two side by side. And over time, those kind of munge, they have dependencies on each other. Again, tech debt list. So what's next? 
user notifications. So iOS 10 comes out. We've got a new Apple framework to integrate with. Uh, we spent a lot of time building the initial like UI application-based ones. So with this one, we're like, OK, real quickly, we're just going to drop it into wherever we need it. And tech debt list again, we'll come back to it. So what's next? OK, so a new analytics library. Product people love to give us new analytics libraries, right? <laughs> so we had a new product owner. They were like, look, we need to bring in Mixpanel. Something about funnels, you know, whatever. OK, fine. <laughs> we'll, we'll drop it in. Uh, but it was, so the initial localytics library was this nice little encapsulated um, box in the service layer. Actually, we don't have time to totally move everything from localytics over to Mixpanel, so we leave that. Let's just bring in a new one for, uh, for Mixpanel. OK. So what happens next? New design pattern, MVVM. We get another new engineer who is like, look, guys, you've got to adopt MVVM. It's the coolest. And we're like, OK, fine, yeah, it is pretty cool. So, <laughs> so we're like, OK, what do we do? We can't convert all of the old views and view controllers. So again, we come up with these sort of like duplicate verticals where we'll put the new logic as we like roll out new features, right? So the same thing goes for um, some other popular design patterns. More new developers, they want to add this stuff. And we're like, yeah, yeah, it's, you know, it's cool. So this kind of just like shows up like all over the code base, as we know, right? Um, and also, it's a new, yeah, more third party libraries to bring in. OK. <laughs> so what is this kind of showing us with like what happens to our architecture over time, right? Like, we wind up kind of bringing in new dependencies. We don't have time to convert um, what they're replacing. And we wind up with these like duplicate verticals all over the place. So this is kind of like it starts to make our code bases feel you know, kind of like a web. And the engineers on the team, especially new ones, wind up like feeling like this when they open their you know, IDE every, like Xcode every day, right? OK, <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I was intro a little bit there. So yes, I've been programming software for 13 years, the last six of which I've been in iOS. But actually, most of that time, for one reason or another, I've done a lot of like client services type of work. I've had a few sort of employment jobs in there, but a lot of it has been some form of consulting or independent contracting. So what that means is that I've actually like seen like a lot of code bases, and I've seen what we just looked at happen like a lot of times and over the life cycle of like many code bases. So I've worked on like greenfield projects, projects that are perhaps quite young, maybe just a year old, um, maybe four years old. The last project that I worked on was a nine-year-old iOS application, and it like definitely showed. Um, a lot of the, um, this vertical duplication that I uh, demonstrated. And sometimes you would find like a single thing done in like five different ways, like five different patterns to do like a single thing. And it crippled this company in terms of what they were able to add um, to, to their features on this app. So all of these experiences have gotten me thinking really deeply about code based longevity. So how, like, what is the useful life of a code base? Why, why is it that when they get older, they feel like they um, become so difficult to work in? You know, in some, in some platforms, maybe it's OK. You know, you have, like, in the, perhaps, like, in the financial sector, you know, some systems have been around for, like, 30 years. And that's OK, because um, you can just kind of, like, keep hitting them. But I feel like in the iOS world, we, are building applications that need to be dynamic and are changing, need to change to bring in new, um, support new things each year. You know, Apple gives us new everything every year, you know. Um, and so I feel like it's, it's really, longevity is something to think about deeply with iOS apps, um, and it's really important. OK, so trends that I've seen in my, like, sort of experience, having seen a lot of these code bases, is that, yes, feature velocity seems to always drop over time. So I think a lot of people say that, well, that's because the complexity of the architecture is, is going up. Is, you know, we're adding new things, complexity rises. 
So I actually reject that. I think that's a cop-out. Um, I think it's actually architectural inconsistencies that are rising, like the ones we looked at in this example. And with that, developer pain rises, right? Like, we felt that pain, and it is, like, not fun, right? Um, yeah, so my, my hypothesis is that if we can actually keep architectural inconsistencies low, we can keep developer pain low, and we can keep future feature velocity high. So, instead of feeling like this every day <laughs> when we look at the code, um, we can feel like this. This is the lovely uh, Julia, who is uh, a friend of mine back in New York City. Um, okay, so I want to talk about best practices. So we all know and love a lot of these best practices. These are what drive us to build code bases that last, right? They're well discussed, um, you know, we debate them to no end on how to best implement them. And I feel like actually proficiency in a lot of these has gone up since I've actually entered this field um, 13 years ago. But I think we're lacking something that ties it all together. And that is an appreciation for consistency. <laughs> so you may say, well, consistency is boring. <laughs> Um, but I think that's wrong. I think consistency is actually liberating. If you can go from having, you know, increased pain as the code base gets older and lower velocity to having less pain and higher velocity, that's great, right? So I think the need is so critical that we need a new principle. And I'm calling it the consistency principle. So when I thought about this name, I said, oh, you know, I wonder if this thing already exists. It, um, it is a concept in the accounting world, so it has to do with um, once you adopt an accounting practice, you, can, you should basically keep it for the life cycle of your books. And so I think that's really strict. I don't want to adopt it in that context. I think we need to bring it into our nomenclature in a more dynamic way, but in a way that sort of appreciates architectural consistency and prioritizes decisions that allow us to reach it and keep it. Okay, so the other side of it is, like a name is a powerful thing, right? If we have a name for something, it allows us to all understand like a complicated idea or a complex idea, say a name and then it comes to everybody's head and you can move forward with decision making from there. So another thing, um, uh, around that. Okay, so, what is it? So the consistency principle is, it is shared vocabulary, it's shared value in the longevity of a code base, and it's shared agreement to make decisions that increase or maintain architectural consistency. It's also an agreement to prioritize one thing that your code, one thing done in your code base with one pattern. So resisting those sort of duplicate verticals from the um, example we saw. So what it is not is a commitment to keep original architectural patterns or a limit on new engineers that they won't be able to add their new flavor. In fact, it's actually, um, it should actually allow those things. Okay, so how? <laughs> uh, so first of all, starting out with sort of the, a litmus test idea. So if we all have this shared vocabulary that, hey, we're gonna prioritize consistency, we can sort of use this as like a litmus test in our day-to-day -day decision making. We can evaluate um, the options at hand against whether or not we're gonna be increasing or decreasing consistency. But, how, um, how to handle it when you want to make a big change, right? Like, that's kind of the big question. So, we're going to go into it. But over, overall, it's, I like to think about it as kind of bringing a, a holistic architectural view to these coding best practices that we already have. So with, the, with this um, in mind, and that the biggest offender of inconsistency is really these duplicate verticals that we talked about and how those get introduced by you know, new patterns that people want to bring in, new dependencies. 
So how do you prepare to make big changes like that? To take out an old pattern and put in a new pattern, or to take out an old dependency and put in a new dependency? So I'm going to look through um, one example. Um, there, you know, th I think this one, this one that I have found is like the most critical in being able to like quickly make changes to your architecture. Um, so let's look at this sort of like example of like some a typical iOS layer. This is like that first year architecture we landed on that we really liked. Um, where do we start? So for me, the starting point is to understand and respect these layers um, to such an extent that you almost think about each as its own API. Now, I don't know, I guess, I'm not sure how many people have done API design be before. I come from this web development background where I actually built several APIs. So I kind of carry that knowledge with me. But in API design, you think really deeply about your inputs and outputs, and you almost want people who are consuming it to not know what's going on inside, and it should be a black box to the consumers. And you really kind of think about um, minimizing entry points. So between layers. So number one, we're, we're considering each box as sort of its own little uh, black box and considering the way it communicates with outside um, layers, uh, like an API. And in doing that, really attempting to minimize entry points into that layer. And we're going to go through a code example right now of how that helps us sort of like swap out um, new patterns or new dependencies. So we're going to look at a network service, which is like kind of cool because I feel like the two talks this morning, I'm actually going to be able to like reference a little bit of what Glenna um, and Natalia talked about. So I think that's, I'm gonna, I hope I do that well. Um, so let's consider a class. We have here a network service. It implements a protocol. Let's take a look at that protocol. So this is um, a network service that is going to re retrieve some digital content for us. So you can imagine that um, it's going to implement these functions to go like make a network call, get, give us back an object, right? Um, and really, we could imagine that perhaps you know, we have many more functions inside of this, all responsible for um, going and getting something from the network. So we're going to look at this top one, the get video. And right now, we kind of have, I have an implementation of this that looks horrible, but it is kind of like everything that you probably need to do to like fire off the network call. So there's some, um, there's some header additions, you know, building the URL request, like sending it, deserializing um, the response to an object, and then maybe some error handling. So standard sort of best practices. We know we need to clean this up, right? So we're, we can probably start with pulling out some of these responsibilities. So we'll do that. We'll pull out the JSON deserialization into a helper file. Great. Um, all of this stuff that has to do with like headers and uh, parameter stuff, let's pull that out into another helper. Great. OK. So this is, <laughs> this is looking a little bit better. It's still not great. but. Um, the, um, this is kind of the crux, like the crux of you know, still performing a network call um, that we need to do with get video. So the challenge is, is that we actually have all of these other functions to implement as well. So imagine that this network service is going to go ahead and implement all of those, right? That's increasing the entry points. Well, wait, wait, didn't we say we wanted to like, minimize the entry points into this service in this layer, right? So how could we do that? <laughs> um, let's look at how we could actually make this protocol only have like, a single entry point. So here's what that looks like. What if it's like just get, you know, get me a resource and return, me, um, return the resource to me when, you, um, when you've got it? So the, um, 
the remote resource can implement the kind of like the three things that um, were happening inside that function. So providing an error message, building a request, and deserializing data. So let's look at what that looks like for just that first video resource. It's all ni nicely encapsulated inside this object, and it's conforming to that remote resource protocol. That's great, right? So let's look at what that network service now looks like. So now I can, I can have any sort of resource that conforms to that remote resource protocol can get passed in, and we can kind of fire out a generic network session, um, URL session data task. So um, with one entry point, by minimizing this and taking it down to one entry point, we've made it like, incredibly easier in the future to switch this out, right? Like we have one function now where we would go, if we wanted to bring in Alamo Fire, we just have one place to do it instead of those four places, making the path to kind of like totally swapping out an old dependency with a new dependency like much easier. So, um, yeah. So yeah, looking at this, and this is where I'm going to kind of come back um, to um, Natalia's talk. She was uh, talking really interestingly about um, handing back like this future result. So if we got to that point where we wanted to like support some sort of promise behavior with this function, now we just have one place to implement that support um, and one place to change the um, the, ex the, the, the way the external world will kind of talk to this protocol and talk to this network service. So kind of another example of how it makes it easier to, to switch out your dependencies. Okay, so I wanna kind of, I wanna talk about what the, what the kind of powerful thing is here. By, by minimizing the entry points into this layer, we are prioritizing like sort of the need for um, architectural duplication that often comes in when we want to adopt new dependencies or new patterns. So we've done that in a way where we've used an abstraction that prepared us for more flexibility in this space. And through that, we were able to likely maintain the consistency of how this architecture works, um, this network layer architecture works with the outside world, um, allowing for these changes. So in closing, uh, the consistency principle is shared commitment for for one thing and one pattern in our code base, so resisting those duplicate verticals. Hopefully it enables us to make big changes around design patterns and dependencies. Hopefully it also allows us to mitigate the impact of developer turnover and allows us to let new developers bring their flavor to the architecture in the code base. And hopefully also it allows us to really place a value and a prioritization in code base longevity, allowing for code bases to sort of live, um, live longer. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you so much. Yeah, so our, do we have time for questions? Okay. I guess. Hello? Hi. Um, so you mentioned about minimizing pain and also allowing users and developers to bring in their own um, sort of insights and whatever. I would like to know how do you reconcile differing opinions that are related to skill levels? So to give you a concrete example, we have in our company data binding that is done by more intermediate to advanced developers in Rx, and then we have uh, new starters who use the protocol delegate uh, pattern. Uh, yeah. I would just like to know how do you rec reconcile something that is more about skill level as opposed to just an opinion of MVC versus MVVM right, 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 or MVC right. or whatever. So. That one's really easy, um, pair programming. 
<laughs> so they should be pair programming with those junior devs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Over there. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. So considering the uh, consistency principle, how would you advise someone to, um, uh, to progress, so to change M MVM to MVVM? OK. So I guess, yeah, that kind of goes into um, how do you take, how do you start, like, so the example that we looked at was really like almost how do you design your architecture from the start to be able to like easily make changes. So the viewpoint or the, the question of how do you take an architecture where maybe you, you weren't minimizing, you know, creating nice encapsulated layers and minimizing um, entry points into them. So how do you then like sort of adopt a new pattern? Um, I did this on that nine year code base that I talked about. We actually like totally replaced um, their networking layer with, uh, they were a very like, they were offline um, app that had a lot of data syncing when they were online. So there was a lot of complexity in like network requests. Um, and what we did was basically we created like a really small API that was everything the rest of the app needed to get like, and it was very abstract ideas like, okay, go perform this series of network calls and that's just the one API entry point. I know you asked about view models, but what I'm trying to say is um, um, first it's like use a, use a sort of a strangler pattern, if you will. So create like a layer that has minimal, you know, entry points, conform the existing architecture to that um, that's underneath of it and then like slowly move over time, but you have to get team buy-in for that kind of thing. And converting views, I mean, converting view controllers to MVVM is uh, probably kind of a different thing. You have to have to go, kind of go through each one. So you have to make the commitment, I suppose. Any other questions? Oh, there's one. Hi there, thanks for the talk. Uh, I'd like to ask you, on that very complex project, how did you convince the client to buy in on the changes? And do you, were okay. they ready to pay for it? Yeah. <laughs> so like I said, I mean, they were just like crippled by bugs. Like any time a small change was introduced, you know, it was just like, it was just like weeks, weeks fixing bugs and um, crash reports. And I mean, it was, it was actually a, a hybrid app, so there's a lot of stuff in Objective C and KVO, and the whole old like networking s system was like entrenched in KVO, and it was it was a, like a minefield. So I mean, basically, they bought into it because it was they just weren't able to do anything for like quarter after quarter. They were just achieving so little um, that we said, look, you've you've got to like make some some structural changes, and they we we replaced that whole networking layer stabilized it, and now that app is kind of like continuing on with a minimal maintenance mode while they're actually going to rewrite their, se they have two apps, they're going to rewrite the second one um, um, and in a preparation for like letting this other one sit and hopefully using some shared resources to rewrite the second. So I mean it really depends on the, the roadmap, like what people want to achieve. I always try to like understand exactly what a company is like trying to get to in the next like 12 months and align any recommendations to that. So this kind of fit in with that. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone.